I mean, is there something we can do to this sequence to make it this? In other words, can I add, let me just put the slide up, is there a pattern of length 6, because that's the first place it differs, that I can add to this such that the result is counted by the large Schroeder numbers? So this question, this was not my question, but this was a question of Eric Eggy, um, who conjectured back at the uh, AMS fall meeting a few years ago, he conjectured that the patterns that make it work are those following uh, the five patterns. That any of those will indeed make this equal to the large Schroeder numbers. Um, and so since this phenomenon happens sort of all over the place, this was interesting if we could actually prove it. Uh, there was only one other instance. Bona proved something similar a while ago um, with, with respect to some other patterns, but stuff like the, this flavor hadn't really been around too much. Um, so the, all this is saying is this is just the generating function for the large Schroeder numbers. It's those 2, 6, 22, 90, 364. Um, so we have that. Um, and in fact, these are the only, so you, experimentally you can show that nothing else will work. So these values and the 180 degree rotations of those patterns will work, nothing else. Um, now by the time I got to this, a few things were proved. So um, Alex Burstein and Jay Pantone proved the case uh, 246135, and they did so using simple permutations, which I'm not gonna talk about today, um, but they're, uh, they are simple, but they're incredibly powerful. Um, that was an idea of, of of uh, Michael Albert um, contributed that, uh, that wonderful idea. Um, then myself and Burstein proved the other remaining cases. So there's four additional cases, we proved those. Interestingly, one of the cases, this last one, was also we needed the idea of simple permutations. So I'm not going to talk about that one either. What I will talk about is the remaining three. The remaining three we were able to prove using um, enumerative techniques by decomposing things with left to right maxima. So it's exactly like right to left maxima, but now flip it around. Okay. So, that, that, so what I want to sort of take you through in the time we have left is an idea of how I did that. Okay. So I'm just going to pick one of them and um, I'll just pick one and we'll, we'll, we'll look at the decomposition. Um, and there's not really a lot of time, but I'll sort of go through this quickly, um, just sort of as an aside, this motivated a new definition. Okay, it's this idea of unbalanced Wolf equivalence. And the this is sort of provides one of the first examples of this. Because the separable permutations, which is a classical permutation class, is counted by the large Schroeder numbers. What the? What the? They're all the things, the separables are all the things that you can build by um, you start with x, and then you can build, um, if this is in your class, and that's in your class, you can take sort of the direct sum of them, or you can take the skew sum of them. And it's everything you can build that way, by the separables. So the separables of your show, and it's, it's, a, it's a cute um, argument to show that they're counted by the large Schroeder numbers. So what this would show is if we could prove this for any of those tau's, it would show we have this equality, which would show that this set of things was Wolf equivalent to that set of things. And this is sort of unusual because there's, they're like, they have different cardinalities. And that's usually not something that, that, that's been studied. So all this is, so I'm going to sort of skip this. This is just that general phenomenon. And in fact, if you go out hunting for other things where the two sets have different cardinalities, you find this happens all over the place. So it seems to be very, very common, yet completely not understood. Um, so they, they're bad. Okay, um, so that's got sort of a, a nice consequence of this, but let's look at how we actually proved it. Uh, so to begin, the one thing that's common to all these uh, permutation classes are the patterns 2143 and 3142. Those were the first two we started with. And let's see, just like I did before, let's see what they look like. And I claim they, 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 they look like this. Here are the, the left to right maxima. I've represented them this way. 
And everything else has to fit in these decreasing blocks. Right. And similar proofs like we showed, you know, you can, you can go through and substantiate those, or, or um, prove this. Now there's two proper, two sort of, I guess, statistics that we're going to need that I haven't talked about. That I actually don't know if they're really in the literature, we, we sort of made them up for this. Um, and they're the following. They're the idea of the leading maxima. So they're all the right to left maxima in the beginning that are consecutive in position. So I'll just represent it by that line. And then we have the horizontal gaps. And they're right to left maxima that, well, that are also descents. Because there are right to left maxima such that the element after it is below. Okay, so here we have right to, these all increase, and then after this we have a gap. All right, so this gap, to represent this gap, I, I refer to him as a horizontal gap. But the leading one, doesn't it also decrease right after it? And it is a horizontal, with this one here? Yeah. It is a horizontal gap as well. Okay. Yep, he's, he's both, he's one of the leading maxima and he's also a horizontal gap. So the leading just means the first one? Or? First, so many, they're, they're all the consecutive ones. Okay. There's a whole bunch that'll be consecutive. In now, can they be consecutive? Because they can't be in the same spot. In position. So. These are the ones that, in positions one through L, uh -huh. all of these elements are leading, are, ma are left to right maxima. All right, anything in one through L? One through L. And then the next one is not. So the next one's somewhere in here, and he's not a, a, a left to right maxima. How does L get picked? Or it's just, it's just the largest. It's, 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 the, it's the first place where it... So where it decreases. Where it, yeah, it's just the first place where okay. the spot after it is the first decrease. Got it. Okay. So we have that. So we have these two ideas. And what we're going to do is we're going to do um, a sort of uh, cases based on a horizontal gap, and we're going to keep track of our leading maxima as a catalytic variable to make this work. So the, the horizontal gaps give us our cases. The leading maxima are going to give us our catalytic variable. So here are the three cases. All right. um, we're going to consider no horizontal gaps, exactly one horizontal gap, and at least two horizontal gaps. And the generating function that I want to actually be working with is this one. So I'm going to look at all the permutations that avoid the things I'm interested in. All right. And I'm going to keep track of the length of that permutation and the number of leading maxima that it has. Those are the two things. All right. Well, if we have no horizontal gaps, well, that's just going, you have no horizontal gaps if and only if you're completely in increasing sequence. All right. That's counted by this. All right. So there's nothing to do, this has nothing to do with the tau that we're actually counting. We're counting 2, 5, 4, 6, 1, 3. Okay. This is just true in general. If I have exactly one horizontal gap, I have to look like this. I increase, I have my, my last one, then I have something, because I have to have a gap, and then I have some trailing guys here. So how would I build this in general? And this again has nothing to do with the pattern of interest. Right? How I would build this, well, I'll start with an element of my pattern class, a okay, generic element, and I identify its some number of its leading maxima. Doesn't have to be all of them just some number of them. Then I'm going to stick an x there, do an operation I call extraction. So I'm going to take those guys and pop them off to the left. And then I just get to tag on some trailing increasing sequence. So if you turn all this into um, translating this into functional equations, what you're going to get is this. So a few minutes, we can sort of piece this up apart a little bit. This 1 over 1 minus x is going to count that guy, right, just the increasing bit. The tx is because this thing here, remember I have to put it a t because it becomes a leading maxima, it's one of the leading maxima. And then e is representing this extraction. And that's, that's this down here, um, where the reason I'm dividing by 1 minus T is I'm choosing how many leading maxima do I want to pull out one or the first two 
or the first three, or the first four. So that looks like, well, you could choose zero, one, two, three, four. It looks like some sort of geometric series. And if you write that succinctly, you'll get this expression. So t tends to zero, does this break back into the other formula or no? Oh, why do I have this? This last part here? Yeah. Or, oh, this, so this last part is here is I just want to make sure that when I'm done with this, I don't actually, I'm not in the other case of the increasing. Oh, so that's why you put that in there. That's why this minus is here. But yeah. if you omit that, then this formula covers both cases, right? Um, you have to know because this E is being multiplied here. Um, and then in the other case, it's not. So, so A is a function of T and X. A is a, a, is a function of T and X, yeah. And B is, B is just T. the one. Yeah. <laughs> so we need another equation for A versus E. A, I'm sorry? So how do you... Well, what is A? A, a, a I had on the previous slide. Oh, okay. Yeah, A, a was so the sorry. generating function here. So it's a system of two. It's, yeah, it's a, a is this. So it's a definition, but. Oh, oh, I, I, oh I haven't set it equal to anything yet. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm just looking at how oh, we yeah, have it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Okay, so this type of thing is counted by, by these, um, these formula. And then lastly, if I have at least two horizontal gaps. And so there isn't complete time to go through all the details, but um, the idea is, and it's very similar to the bijection, you look at the rightmost horizontal gap, and this is where the pattern, at least in this case, matters. Okay? The pattern where, since we're counting this particular tau. Because of this particular tau, the rightmost column decomposes as in this picture. Okay, so I get these blocks like this, and the blocks are separated by these leading maxima out here. It's quite intricate. Um, you can start to see why this happens, because since there's something here that I have, this creates, this will create in, um, no, okay, let me leave that why. Anyways, it does look like this, and, <laughs> uh, um, and so it does look like this. So we have two choices for how I want to build at this point. I can either add another horizontal gap. I can just say, look, I don't want this to be the rightmost one anymore. I just want to add a new one. Or I can add a, insert a block or add a block to this existing horizontal gap. You get two choices. This takes a little more care in order to make sure all the generating functions work out just right. But if you combine all this together, you now get the equation. Right. So you get ATX equals the increasing, so this is no horizontal gaps, one horizontal gap, and then this was the last part. Right. And this is just what we had before. So it's this whole thing. And now we want to solve this. So with a bit of algebra, you get this. Right. So the idea here is to use the kernel method to try and solve it. And uh, Solving for E? Or? No, I'm actually solving for B. B is what I'm, because B, A contains that additional variable, T. Okay. I don't really care about T, uh -huh. so I can set T equal to 1, which is what B is. Okay. okay. So I actually want this, and when you do the kernel method, you don't actually leave A there. Usually you would, but you have to do this change. Um, and you set the kernel equal to 0, and you try and directly have Mathematica solve this, and it fails miserably. You get a mess. Um, and this is where sort of an interesting trick happened that I wanted to share in the last few minutes. Um, so there are other ways to show that this will be the solution to the Schroeder numbers. You can just sort of check that it works for the first few, and then it must work for everything based on some sort of. Oh, right, okay, so this is the equation for B? This is linear B. Oh, I'm sorry? This is the, that's the equation. Oh, you can set it up. And you plug it in, you get a mess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you try and solve this, because it is a cubic, um, a cubic in, in T, in T, okay. you get a mess. So the, the, you can solve it, but Mathematica, I don't think, gives the right answer. Um, because it does not seem to work. Yeah, we could do it implicitly. Right, you could do it implicitly, but you can now do it, you can also, I want to show you how you can do it algebraically as well. So instead, let's just assume T is the desired solution, and then the thing that, and this is where the difference is, usually when you do the kernel method, you, this is your kernel, you solve the kernel, and then take that and plug it into the other side. 
which is this side here, and then you get out your answer. That's usually how the, the kernel method almost 99% of the time works. But in this case, you have, if you're a little more clever, you can do it algebraically. So we can let t be the desired solution, and then, I don't know what it is, but now plug it into the right-hand side. And the right-hand side simplifies and becomes that. This is a very, very nice expression. Right. And now I can use this the fact, to reduce. Algebraically, just keep reducing everything. So that was what I had before. It ends up reducing to this. And now this is something, this is just a, 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 a quadratic. And then I can solve it directly, and it works out. And so that's it. Yeah, that's beautiful and yeah, fascinating equation. Any questions? We have two minutes for questions. Yeah. Is there any hope of so of uh, experimentally looking for more of these you know, unbalanced balance wealth equivalences? Um, a bunch of people did do that. They found a whole bunch of them. Okay. Um, most are not proved. Okay. Yeah, they they. And did you program your beautiful detector? No. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know I should, but I. Oh, maybe that's good. Working. Yeah, yeah, I can give it to him to, to work on. Um, no, I, I didn't program it, so. But it's been refereed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, is it like I was thinking just about the chains? Like one of the keys was that you can talk about like these aspects, like these maxes and these mins. Or mins weren't discussed, but I'm sure they might be some kind right, of thing right, you right. can cover. Mm -hmm. Can you also talk about, let's say, you were to take like a finite difference of the elements? And then you look for like inflection points or that sort of thing on the chain. Is that? I've never. I don't exactly know. By so like what you do is for each point you take like its difference, uh, or like oh. the difference in height, and you consider this new graph, which might be negative, might be positive. But then there you look for maxes and mins. Oh, I see. You sort of look at the actual difference between the values. Yeah, then... because you can then kind of pull in all these different. So you can then kind of get a blip like. It, Right now, like it, what we're what appears to be used is just the fact that you can talk about the maximums and you can kind of get some idea about the global architecture of the thing. But if you can use like other tools like that, you could really talk about how the curve's swinging and moving up and down. True, but I think you're gonna you could do that. But I think the the problem with that is you're gonna lose the relative ordering of things that you need for patterns. So yeah. things are gonna end up being things in a permutation. Everything is in its own row and column. But when you do that, you're gonna have um, repeats and stuff. Repeats, and then the relative order of things is going to be lost, and, and you're going to, yeah, I don't think that, yeah, it might work for some things. I don't think it's going to work in pattern avoidance mm -hmm. directly. There's some sense in which those differences can be, can, are a lot easier to modify in ways that don't affect the pattern avoidance than the right to left minima are. That's, I, yeah. I sort of, I've sort of looked at these things and dated out very quickly. The, there's the inversion table, which is sort of similar to what you're talking about. You can look at the inversion table, and then the, if you look at the inversion table, there are, I've looked at that in terms of, um, so I think the, the, so patterns of length three in the inversion table work very nicely, and that sort of salvages something that you're talking about, mm -hmm. but in general, I, I've seen a few talks on this, and it, no one really has, there, there's no other strong connections. Um, uh, let's think. Thank you for the question.